What words would you use to describe 2020? How about toilet paper, unprecedented, lockdown, social unrest, presidential election? What about life? Because when it came to issues that matter, abortion was at the top of the list. Abortion has been legal since 1973, 48 years. In fact, it was the only elective procedure allowed in the state of New Jersey during the COVID-19 shutdown. But for the last 35 years, First Choice Women's Resource Centers has provided essential services for women and unborn babies. Through five locations in New Jersey, First Choice protects the unborn by empowering women. All services are free and confidential and include pregnancy tests, ultrasounds to medically confirm pregnancy, and options counseling. One of the women who came to First Choice was Jezebel. When I found out I was pregnant, I think I was in a denial for the first few weeks. I didn't feel prepared to, to be a mother just yet, but I was willing, very much willing to make it work. And when I talked to my boyfriend, I felt very pressured. And then I decided to go ahead and go through with an abortion. So we were at the clinic and the nurse gave me the pills, but at that second, I felt such a conviction in my heart that it was the wrong thing to do. And I knew I had to ask for forgiveness. A few days after taking the pill, I bled and I, I noticed that I was having symptoms of a miscarriage. And at that time, I just said, I, I know he's gone. I know I, I aborted the baby. And I felt God was punishing me for what I had done. I didn't feel any symptoms of being pregnant anymore. <laughs> and I just, I just thought, he's gone. I know God took him away from me. And I didn't even want to live anymore. I thought what I did was horrible and I couldn't forgive myself. I did find a hotline to call from First Choice and walking in First Choice, I, I was terrified also. Um, I didn't know what to expect from the doctors and nurses, but I walked in and everyone was very friendly and warm with me. I, I met a nurse named Rhea and immediately she told me that we were going to try and um, take a pill to reverse the effects of the original one. I said, I know he's gone. I don't feel him anymore. I know it's gone. <laughs> and she did an ultrasound. It was so quiet in the room. And I just sat up and I said, what's happening? She said, he's still there. He was healthy and his heartbeat was strong. And every time I go to the doctor now, they tell me what a strong heartbeat he has. And I know he's a miracle baby. <laughs> and he's my miracle baby. And I'm so grateful to God and everyone he surrounded me with and the nurses and First Choice. <laughs> so people that support First Choice, I would say thank you to them. My baby is here because of them. And, you know, I'm a mom. I'm a mom because of First Choice. <laughs> Our ability to provide high quality personal care, such as one-on-one -on -one counseling, medical services, and practical support at no cost is the result of the individuals, churches, and foundations who invest in our ministry. We receive no government funding. 90 cents of every dollar goes directly to program services and management, with 10 cents to development. It costs us $1,200 to rescue a baby, Later this year, we will serve women and babies through our new location in New Brunswick. Would you help us rescue a baby today? There are three ways to give. One, if your church is participating this year, pick up a baby bottle, fill it with your spare change, cash, or check made payable to First Choice. Return it to your church by February 21st, and the funds will be counted and given directly to our ministry. Two. Text First Choice to 45777. Three, give online at www.firstchoicebottles.com. Thank you for your support. We give her the facts so she can make an informed choice.
Good morning, church. I hope this message finds you safe and well. We're going to continue our Ready Sermon series with the second installment with the message I've entitled, Blessed Are. It's a closer look at the Beatitudes of the Lord's Sermon on the Mount and are included in those words of Christ we often find highlighted in red ink in the Gospels of the Bible. I've determined after much prayer following our Advent Christmas season series messages to look at a red ink series where we would examine those words of Christ written in red we find in the Bibles. Those words that Jesus said in his three years of preaching and teaching ministry down to the last sayings of Christ in those last hours, in those last moments with his disciples. I believe as we examine Christ's words written in red ink, we will discover anew the truths that he shared with his disciples then and what the Lord desires to share with his disciples today. Some years ago, while we were living in Virginia and I was completing seminary, we observed a large number of vehicles on the roadway displaying those prestige license plates. Some would have their owner's initials. Some would have a cryptic mixture of numbers and letters that would convey some type of message. Some would actually spell out a word, for example, blessed, B-L-E-S-S-D. I've always thought it was ironic that such a prestige license plate would usually be seen on a prestige vehicle like a Mercedes or a BMW, a Lexus or a Cadillac. I've never, never seen one displayed on a broken down old car far more common, maybe even a pedestrian make or model with obvious wear and tear and in need of great repair. It clearly sends the message to those who would have a mind to see it that to be blessed is to have material wealth. What's even more ironic is that this imagery is far from the imagery of being blessed as we see in God's Word. I want you to join me today as we turn in the Bible to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, picking up in verse 1, where we'll take a closer look at the Lord's teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, where we see exactly what the Lord meant when he said, blessed are. Join me in Matthew chapter 5, picking up in verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today after hearing your word spoken in your house. We pray that you would open our eyes to see the truth that you have for us, our ears that we might hear your spirit's prompting, our minds that we might grasp these truths, and our hearts that we would be receptive to them. And we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people say, Amen. This portion of the text has become known as the Beatitude. The sayings that introduce Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 3 through 11, or the parallel passage containing four sayings in Luke 6, verses 20 through 22. The term beatitude is taken from the Latin word for blessed or fortunate, the word that begins each of these sayings. If we classified every blessed our statement in the Bible as beatitude, we would find many. In the Old Testament, the man whom God corrects, Job 5.17, all who do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but delight in the law of the Lord, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2, 
All who take refuge in God. Psalm 2, verse 12. The person who has regard for the weak. Psalm 41, verse 1. All such are among those pronounced blessed. Paul also uses the beatitude form in Romans 14, verse 22, as does James in his letter in chapter 1, verse 12, and John in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3, chapters 14, verse 13, chapter 16, verse 15, chapter 19, verse 9, chapter 20, verse 6, chapter 22, verse 7, and 14. Still, the words of Christ in Matthew and in Luke are generally considered to be the Beatitudes. While these sayings of Jesus have a traditional form, they radically challenge the tradition of his day. The Old Testament takes the stance that blessings will come in this life to the person who keeps God's law. This view is rooted in the Lord's commitment to his people stated in the Mosaic Covenant. Obedience will bring blessing and prosperity. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14 teach. And disobedience will bring punishment and national disaster. Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 68 teach. Yet Jesus goes so far as to describe the poor as blessed and the rich woeful. The hungry blessed and the well fed as troubled. Some commentators argue that Jesus is speaking eschatologically here. Jesus' forecast of blessing is associated with the coming of the kingdom of heaven. The blessedness of the godly life will not be experienced on earth, but awaits history's end. Thus, they see Jesus' redefining of the Old Testament promises of divine reward in our immediate future to teach that rewards will be delayed until the final triumph of righteousness. But the kingdom of God is just not future. Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere about the moral and spiritual principles of his kingdom, principles which would fill the lives of his followers on earth. While God's kingdom will have future expression at history's end, Jesus' kingdom also existed when he spoke, and it exists now. Jesus is king, and wherever believers live out their allegiance to him, Christ's kingdom has a present phase. In stating his Beatitudes, Jesus sought to startle his listeners. His images of the wealthy poor, the happy mourner, and the persecuted peacemaker were intended to jolt his listeners into thinking about and questioning the traditional values and attitudes that shaped their lives. And the Beatitudes should have the same impact on believers today. Men and women of every age should examine themselves and make sure that the things which are important to them are the things that are important to God. The kingdom of God still exists, and his people are still called to renounce the allegiance to the values of this world in full commitment to the kingdom of the Lord, says the Revelled Bible commentary. As I continue to do my sermon preparation and review various commentaries, I came across a, a commentary by Anthony J. Saldonini, who writes in his commentary of the text, Blessings in Jewish prayers usually begin with the Hebrew participle baruch, addressed to God as well as to humans. However, the kind of beatitude here, which are introduced by Ashrei in the Hebrew and or Makarios in the Greek in the Bible and the Second Temple Jewish literature, are never addressed to God, but refer to human beings, either in the second or third person. In wisdom literature, they exhort people to wise, good behavior or to avoidance of foolish, evil behavior. In narratives, they express joy over good fortune or hope for consolation in time of suffering. And in apocalyptic literature, they express hope in times of oppression. The Matthean Beatitudes conform to this type. They refer to humans, the first in the eighth and in the third person, and the final one in the second person. They console, exhort, and promise eschatological vindication. The eight Beatitudes are actually nine in number, but since the last two concern enduring persecution in the third and second person, respectively, they are usually treated as one. The first and the eighth in verses three and 10 have the same reward, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
so that they form an inclusion bracketing the list. Some commentators divide the list in half with the first half concerned with the needy, the poor, mourners, the powerless, and the unjustly treated. And the second with wise and good activity, mercy, peacemaking, purity of heart, and fortitude in unjust treatment and persecution. The Beatitudes structurally contrast the seven curses or woes in chapter 23. Also, in Luke 6, 20 through 26, has a parallel list of four Beatitudes and woes together. The content of the Beatitudes has been influenced heavily by Isaiah 61, which mentions the poor in verse 1, comfort for the mourners in verse 2, righteousness in verses 3, 8, and 11, and healing for the brokenhearted, similar to the pure of heart in verse 1. Inheriting the land is found in verse 7, as well as Psalm 37, verse 11. And the kingdom of heaven is functionally equivalent to the preaching of the good news found in Isaiah 61, 1. The Beatitudes set the tone and the agenda for the Sermon on the Mount. Much effort has been expended in arguing whether they are ideals, ethical demands, eschatological promises, gifts of God's grace, or entrance requirements for the kingdom, says Erdman's commentary on the Bible. So what is it exactly the Lord said in his Sermon on the Mount that was so controversial? What was it about these B attitudes, as we've come to refer to them, that so divides theologians, denominations, and institutions, and even churches? Are they ideals? Are they ethical demands? Are they eschatological promises? Are they gifts of God's grace? Are they entrance requirements for the kingdom? Or are they altogether something different? Well, let's examine each of the Lord's statements briefly and then examine our own hearts as we look together at what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes. The poor in spirit. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I've always been taught that the Lord's words here, poor in spirit, meant those who knew just how desperate they needed God, how poor they were in lacking a right relationship with God. These are the people who come to realize their hopeless and harassed and hapless estate, absent God's grace moving over them, God's favor resting on them. John MacArthur writes in his commentary on the text, blessing literally means happy, fortunate, blissful. Here it speaks of more than a surface emotion. Jesus describes the divinely bestowed well-being that belongs only to the faithful. The Beatitudes demonstrate that the way to heavenly blessedness is opposite the worldly path people normally follow to find happiness. Worldly ideas that happiness is found in riches, merriment, abundance, leisure, and such things. The real truth is the very opposite. In the Beatitudes, Jesus describes the character of true faith. Poor in spirit is the opposite of self-sufficiency. Spiritual poverty includes the deep humility of recognizing one's utter spiritual bankruptcy. As we understand from Luke 13. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven clearly presupposes the truth of salvation by grace. Jesus teaches that the kingdom is a gracious gift to those who sense their own poverty of spirit. Those who mourn. He said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. It would be natural for us to read this portion of the text with an interpretation of the English word mourn here, as we use it in the sense of mourning for the loss of or death of another. And while that would certainly lend itself as a correct understanding of the word we use for mourn to mean as in mourning, it is not the intended use as the context here indicates. Here the word means mourn, to mean to have a godly sorrow for what we have done against God what we have thought about God, how we've thought about God, what we've said about God, and what we've done against God. 
It's a mourning, a sorrow, a godly sorrow that motivates us, brings us to a place of repentance for our sin. How we've not only treated God, but how we've rebelled against God's word, resisted doing God's will, and refused to walk in God's way. MacArthur again comments, mourning over sin means having that godly sorrow that produces repentance, leading to salvation without regret, as in 2 Corinthians 7.10. The comfort is the comfort of forgiveness and salvation, as we, we see written in Isaiah 40, verses 1 and 2. The meek. He said, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. It's interesting to note that many people confuse the English word meekness with the English word weakness, yet the two are in no way the same. The English word meek means quiet, gentle, easily imposed upon, submissive, enduring injury with patience, without resentment, deficient in spirit and courage. And while that contemporary understanding of meek as the adjective means a person who is willing to go along with whatever other people want to do, that does not equate with the scriptural understanding of what meekness means. Meekness, according to the Bible, is an attribute of human nature and behavior. It's been defined several ways as righteous, humble, teachable, patient under suffering, long-suffering, willing to follow gospel teachings, and an attribute of a true disciple. In the former, to be meek is to be viewed as weak, while in the latter, to be meek is to be viewed as strength under self-control, as empowered under the authority of God's Holy Spirit. MacArthur's commentary on this portion of the text reads, Meekness is the opposite of being in control. It's not weakness, but rather supreme self-control empowered by the Spirit, as we see in Galatians 5.23. For they shall inherit the earth, quotes again Psalm 37.11. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Someone once said, if you're not hungry for God, you're probably full of yourself. In order for one to be filled, they must first recognize their emptiness. Yet all too many people are so full of themselves and their own self-righteousness that they never experience that hunger and thirst for righteousness of God that the Lord spoke of here. Two, there's an emptiness within a person whose life is not filled by God. That person's life seems to always be a life longing for something or somewhere or someone. It's always just out of reach, and it matters not all that they do have or who they hold close. Theirs is a life of restlessness, of a constant longing, an attempt to fill that emptiness, that thirsting and longing for something they do not have. In fact, I read a quote Charles Spurgeon said, you will never know the fullness of Christ until you know the emptiness of everything else but Christ. MacArthur says, hunger and thirst for righteousness speaks of those who seek God's righteousness rather than attempt to establish a righteousness of their own. Romans 10.3 and Philippians 3.9 teach, as the self-righteous Pharisees have done, God's righteousness will fill those who seek it. It will satisfy their hunger and thirst for a right relationship with God. You know, it was D.L. Moody who said, God does not send anyone away empty except those who are full of themselves. Think about that. God wants to fill us with himself. We must first empty ourselves. The merciful. He said, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. In the Bible, God's word, the Lord teaches in Matthew 7, 12 that we should treat others in the same way that we ourselves would want to be treated. This maxim, as it's been called, refers to one's treatment of others that it should be guided by the idea that as we would want to be treated, so should we treat others. In the Bible, the virtues of mercy and compassion are mentioned in various forms hundreds of times. 
especially in describing God's nature. Instead of giving us what we deserve, God has shown mercy again and again, not to take away our responsibility, but to give us a chance to repent and be saved. We can ask ourselves, what have we done with this opportunity? As undeserving recipients of God's mercy, grace, and love, nothing else would be more fitting than if we ourselves would show that same unreserved mercy, grace, and love, that compassion for others. Indeed, we're commanded to do just that, to be merciful as God is merciful, as in Luke 6, 36. The merciful, extending mercy to others, thus demonstrating God's mercy, which has been extended to them, writes Louis A. Valeri, Jr. of the Bible Knowledge Commentary. MacArthur's commentary also adds, they shall obtain mercy. The converse, the unmerciful, obtain judgment. It's also true, as in James 2.13. The concept of being merciful and being shown mercy is revealed in many of the Lord's teachings. The pure in heart. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. One commentary I read said, let's look at the meaning of pure in Merriam-Webster. It means unmixed with any other matter. A pure heart is a single heart without mixture heart that seeks only the Lord and takes the Lord as the unique goal. 1 Timothy 1.5 teaches, to be pure in heart is to be single in purpose, to have the singular goal of accomplishing God's will for God's glory, as 1 Corinthians 10.31 teaches. When we're pure in heart, we seek the Lord only, take Him as our only goal, and have the accomplishing of God's will for God's glory as our only purpose. The Lord's word to us is not blessed are the clean in heart, but blessed are the pure in heart. Our heart may be clean, not dirty with sin, but it may not be pure, unmixed, and single toward the Lord. Anything, not just sinful things, can cause our hearts to be impure or mixed toward the Lord. If we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we seek many things besides the Lord himself. We have other goals besides the Lord, and we aren't single or absolute when it comes to God when being accomplished. We may still aim at the Lord, but at the same time, we aim at other things. Be it even physically, it's hard for our eyes to focus on two objects at the same time. We end up seeing neither object clearly. In the same way, when we focus on things we're seeking or aiming at, not on Christ only, it's hard for us to see God in our fellowship with the Lord. For instance, things in the world, such as wealth and success and material objects and entertainment, can attract our hearts. And when we seek them, our heart is impure toward the Lord. Often, we don't even realize our hearts have become divided until we notice how dry and unhappy we become and how far away the Lord seems to be. Because we're fallen, we're all susceptible to have a mixed heart. That's why it's so important for us to have that daily time of devotion with the Lord. That time we set apart to devote just to the Lord. Spend our best time in the Lord's presence. We find he is faithful to enlighten us concerning any sins we need to confess to him. But in addition to confessing our sins, we need to experience his forgiveness and his washing Pray for our hearts to be made not just clean, but pure. So we seek only Him. When we seek the Lord and make Him our undivided heart's desire, it means we have no other agendas, as my friend Joe would like to say. It means that we come to Him with a singular purpose, and that is to seek Him, to seek glory for Him, and to seek to serve Him, and seek to do His will with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul, That is to be pure of heart. Well, it isn't hard for anyone to imagine that those who are pure in heart will see God. There's something about such pureness of heart, like that of a small child, that instinctively resonates with us, that such purity of heart is godly. Perhaps the closest thing to purity of heart, a godly purity of heart that most of us will ever see, is the innocence of a child. Yet it's that very childlike purity of heart 
that the Lord calls us as believers to have. But it's not just the purity of heart. It's the maturity of faith. We have to have the mind of an adult growing in our faith and maintain the purity of heart like a child. The purity of heart the Lord speaks of here is not just a heart of faith. It's the heart that's been redeemed, washed clean by the blood of Christ, born again in the power of the Holy Spirit, where we're redeemed and reconciled, restored and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old is gone, the new is come, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 teaches. The pure in heart are those who are inwardly clean from sin through faith in God's provision and continual acknowledging of their sinful condition, says Louis A. Boveri, Jr., again of the Bible Knowledge Commentary. The peacemakers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. But this part of the Beatitudes has always resonated with me as I think so much of what my careers in both law enforcement and ministry have included, being a peacemaker. Well, maybe it's because I saw a correlation with my law enforcement training, experience, or maybe it's because the sidearm I carried so often was referred to as the peacekeeper or the peacemaker. Yet while there may be some relevance, that is not what the Lord was teaching his disciples here in this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Rather, it has more to do with the Lord's teachings about extending God's mercy, grace, and love towards those who mistreat you. Jesus taught much about loving God and loving others. Yet many would have preferred to continue to adhere to the idea of loving God and loving others, but only loving those who love you, treat you right, and who are lovable, but certainly not your enemies. But this places the Lord's statement, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God in a whole new light. It literally means that we must respond to those who treat us badly as God treated us. I want you to think about something with me for a moment. The text of John 3, 16 and 17 now takes on a whole new relevance as it reveals, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Now I want you to take that thought and marry with that what Romans 5, 8 teaches when it says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now put these two thoughts together. It means this, that even though we were at war with God, enemies of God, God so loved us that he sent his one and only son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save us. Christ was the peacemaker. He was the gift of God, the peace of God coming, being extended to us to bring us from being an enemy of God to a child of God, from being at war with God to being God's family, from death to life. That's what being a peacemaker means. We're supposed to do that as peacemakers. The peacemakers show others how to have an inward peace with God and how to be instruments of peace in the world. They desire and possess God's righteousness even when it brings them persecution, says Louis A. Boveri, Jr. This desire to be a peacemaker should stem from a heart that understands that once we too were at war with God, enemies of God, now, by his mercy, grace, and love in Christ, he made it possible for us to move into being at peace with him. As peacemakers, believers in Jesus Christ, it's our job to take that same message of peace with God to even our enemies so that they too can be at peace with God in Christ Jesus. Those who are persecuted because of righteousness. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those who possess 
these qualities would naturally stand out in the crowd and would be misunderstood by others. Thus they'd be persecuted. Others would speak evil about them. However, Jesus' words encourages his followers, for they would be walking in the steps of the prophets who went before them, who also were misunderstood and persecuted, as we see in 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 4, chapter 22, verse 8, and Jeremiah 26, 8 through 11, or chapter 37, verses 11 through 16, or chapter 38, verses 1 through 6, or Daniel chapter 3 and verse 6, Amos chapter 7, verses 10 through 13, says Louis A. Barberry Jr. In fact, the Lord told his disciples they would face persecution. In Matthew 5, 44, he said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbors and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Paul, too, warns that believers will face persecution, writing in 2 Timothy 3.12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This life we will face persecution as believers in Jesus Christ. And since the Bible actually promises us persecution and suffering for our faith, we know that the world is rebellion against God. It hates God. And when he came as a man in the person of Jesus Christ, the world responded by murdering him. Jesus promises us that the world would treat us the same way it treated him, John 15, 20. The first followers of Jesus consistently experienced suffering for the sake of Jesus. In Jerusalem, we see in Acts 8, 1. In Galatia, Galatians 3, 4. In Philippi, in Philippians 1, 29. In Thessalonica, in 1 Thessalonians 2.14, and in Asia Minor, in 1 Peter 4.12, along with the recipients of the letter to the Hebrews in Hebrews 10.32, and Paul himself went through horrible suffering in 2 Corinthians 11.23-29, as did the other apostles we read about in Acts chapters 5-8. through 8. And again, Paul was quite explicit in saying this would be expected by everyone who follows Jesus. In the Bible, suffering and opposition, persecution, are normal parts of the normal Christian life. In closing, what we see in the Beatitudes of Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12, is a clarity call by the Lord to those who would be his disciples to a kingdom lifestyle that helps usher in his countercultural revolutionary worldview that places a new interpretation of who the blessed are. The blessed are not those whose health and wealth and prosperity is evident for all to see with those things which we so very often use to demonstrate how very blessed are we. When in all truth, it is those very things that have kept many of us from truly realizing and experiencing the true meaning of what the Lord meant when he said, blessed are. Blessed are those who deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow him. Blessed are those who would empty themselves to Christ and then be filled with his Holy Spirit and live as he did. Blessed are those on whom his favor rests. Blessed are those who live as Christ commands. Well, until next time, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. Make his face to smile upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. Church, when we're outside these walls, where are we? Yeah, we're on a mission. I'll see you out there.
There's a light shining like a city on the rainbow. I cannot hide the place where I dance. Draw the wheel.